Welcome to the IEPB Learn Sustain the Environment and Save Costs webinar, looking at the innovative actions and learnings of the Arabin Eye Hospital in India. My name is Phil Hoare and I am the IEPB Procurement and Standard List Manager and a member of the IEPB Environmental Sustainability Working Group. I will be chairing this webinar today. If you would like to introduce yourselves to the group today, you can write your name and which country you are from in the chat box on the panel side panel. So a big thank you to our webinar presenters, which is David Lewis from CBM Australia, and uh, who's the focal point for inclusion in eye health and environmental sustainability. We also introduce Inga Ingeborg Steinbach from the Centre of Sustainability Sustainable Healthcare in the UK and Dr. Venkatash, who's the Chief Medical Officer from Arabin Eye Hospital in Pondicherry in India. So the agenda for the webinar will be the welcome and housekeeping notices, which is from me, introduction and welcome to the IEPB Environmental Sustainability Working Group, Community and Practice from David Lewis. And then thirdly, we'll have the triple bottom line and environmental sustainability in eye care from Inga Steinbach. And then environmental sustainability in eye care, the Aravin eye care model from Dr. Venkatash. After the presentations, I will chair a question and answer session, and we aim to wrap up by the end of the hour. Firstly, just a few um, house, housekeeping points. The presenters, presenters will share their screen and will show the PowerPoint presentation, so you should be able to view their computer screen through the GoToWebinar window. Microphones are muted apart from the speakers, as this ensures a better quality webinar. So we aim for this session to be participatory, and attendees will have the chance to ask questions during the question and answer session at the end. So if you have any questions for the presenters, please type them in the chat box. The chat box can be found on the right-hand panel of your screen, and you can post questions either during or after the presentation. My colleague, Susan Evans, is supporting us today with technical issues, so if you have any technical difficulties, for example, with sound, you can send us a message in the chat box. Thank you, Susan, for your support today. It is a good idea to close down all web applications like Google, Outlook, Skype, to get a better quality of a call. And if you have headphones, please use them. I am recording this webinar, and it will be uploaded onto the IPV website, and I will send round the link in a few days' time. Finally, at the end of this webinar, we will be sending you a survey for your feedback. I am now pleased to introduce David Lewis from CBM Australia, who will start the presentations. Okay, David. Uh, hi, yes, ready to go. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it is really great to um, that you have joined us. Uh, I just quickly wanted to bring everyone in to the fact that uh, when we first conceived of the idea of a, an environmental sustainability working group, which was at the General Assembly in 2016, we really had the uh, lives of the world's poorest people in our mind when we came up with the concept. And I would therefore like to just uh, move to the to the rationale of what we're trying to do. Um, and I'm very sorry, Phil, yeah, here we go. Um, the, so the quick outline of my presentation is just the rationale, the background, the objectives of the working group, and then the objectives of this community of practice which you have joined. Firstly, um, as I mentioned, particularly with Dr. Hanafal and um, Andy Castles Brown, a number of us discussed at the General Assembly, we wanted to really have an impact for the poorest people in terms of environmental sustainability. We realise it's um, together with climate change having devastating impacts all around the world. It's particularly affecting the world's poorest communities. And in those communities, people often lack access to safe water and sanitation, to sustainable food and energy. They often live in dangerous and polluted environments, and they're facing increasing risks due to natural and man-made disasters. And of course, these factors have a significant impact on health and well-being. And we do know also that the poorest communities 
which are some of the ones most susceptible to environmental degradation, also tend to have some of the highest rates of both avoidable and permanent blindness uh, around the world. We also, particularly with Dr. Hannah Fowl, who um, is a former president of IAPB, she really focused in on the issues of both the global and planetary health and the role we should play uh, working in eye health in terms of those issues connected to the environment. And we're very concerned that all the development gains uh, achieved in health and poverty alleviation may be lost if we don't have collective action. And of course, the health sector also is a large contributor to emissions and also to environmental degradation. As IAPB members, we also recognise that environment links to eye health and also to the um, presence of neglected tropical diseases. We took, particularly talked about um, the SAFE strategy and trachoma, where environment is part of surgery, antibiotics, facial cleanliness and environment. And if we're going to promote the SAFE strategy, we also clearly want to model good practice ourselves. So as IAPB members, I think all of us online uh, really want to be strongly a part of achieving the sustainable development goals, which clearly link economic, social and environmental factors. Uh, so a very quick background to the working group. Uh, as I mentioned at the General Assembly in 2016, we came up with the idea. Uh, we then proposed the formation of the working group to the board in 2017, and then the working group was launched at the Council of Members in Kathmandu. The current office holders are uh, Mr. Tulsi Ravila Aravind, then myself as co-chair, uh, Dr. Andy Castles-Brown as secretary, then we have about a, another 14 active core members. And I do want to give a very special thanks to IAPB, who have given us terrific support uh, and particularly uh, Mr. Fuelhor online, uh, Miss Emma Foote. And we also have Susan there helping us and also the whole board remains committed. Uh, in a quick summary of the objectives of our working group, we want to create awareness and understanding and we also want to link into in other environmental networks. We want to encourage strong research and an evidence base for what we're trying to achieve. We want to develop some good guidelines, which are also based on evidence. And we, um, this was particularly mentioned by Dr. Hannah Fahl. Uh, we need to have a picture for some of the poorest um, uh, low income settings for eye health, and particularly in terms of sustainable and reliable energy sources for those eye units. We also want to develop a tool so IAPB members can track their carbon emissions and with already good success, we want to see the IAPB General Assembly and other meetings become as environmentally friendly as possible. And we're privileged to have uh, Dr. Venkatesh, who's representing us for the General Assembly with a strong stream of sustainability uh, planned for uh, 2020. Um, in terms of the community of practice, which is what you have joined today, we were trying to work out how, how could our working group actually reach a lot more people, but not only reach them, but also gather all the fantastic ideas which uh, everyone online and in so many other eye health projects around the world has. So we came up with this idea of a community of practice where we could get together for mutual learning, for sharing, and also to encourage each other because unfortunately environment and climate change can be a discouraging business. So we want to see relevant uh, resources shared and uh, Emma from IAPB has kindly set up this page, which you can click through to. So we've got four different sections for articles and case studies, then where we can put presentations and course materials so the presentations from today, we would hopefully load into that section. Then there's also some very good research papers being developed, which we would like to put into that particular area. And then fourthly, we really want to link strongly into 
the very high quality uh, sustainability networks um, which uh, exist on every continent. We have uh, Inga here today uh, also representing one of those. We also want the opportunity to advertise um, different events coming, including things such as this webinar. So uh, that's the purpose of the working group. We've got our own email address, which is also uh, shared on the page there. And with that, I'll um, hand back to Phil. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. That was a good introduction to the Environmental Sustainability Working Group. For our next presentation, um, let me introduce Inga Steinbach from the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare in the UK. Inga, down to you. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm presenting on um, behalf of um, Cassie today, Dr. Cassie Thiel, who unfortunately can't be with us. And I will give you a brief introduction about sustainability in healthcare, why we think it's so important that healthcare should start talking about it, and what has been done so far in eye care, and what is the potential to do more. So, um, if you want to take a step back, um, what does healthcare actually mean to, to you and to uh, every one of us? And I think for all of us, different things come into mind. Um, some of us would just think about preventative care, doing going for an eye check, for example, or having a blood test done at the um, GP. And others will think of the high tech operating room and um, the recent surgery they just had. But what they all have in common is that we use resources. Um, and in the same way as we think about different things when we think about healthcare, the same is true for sustainability. So if you probably talk to a hospital manager and ask what they think sustainability means, the first thing which would come to their mind is financial sustainability. Um, how can they be financially secure to provide healthcare now and in the future. Um, but we need more resources than just finances. We need also to think about um, people, our social impact we have and our social resources. And we also have to start thinking about the planet or the environmental resources we use when we provide healthcare. And if we start losing sight of one of these consequences, um, other consequences will happen elsewhere. So it's really important that we think of all three um, resource areas. Can healthcare and sustainability overlap? So if you think of um, healthcare across the world, for example, in the US, healthcare is responsible for 10% of the US's greenhouse gas emissions. In the UK and Canada, it's 5%, and in Australia, it's 7%. So if the healthcare sector would be a country, it would rank 13th worldwide concerning greenhouse gas emissions, and it would be ahead of the entire of the UK. Um, and this is because healthcare not only uses a lot of energy, we also use a lot of supplies. So if you just think of the sheer number of items we use every day from surgical accounts to dressing and syringes and simple things like cotton swaps, but also the high-tech MRI scans, they all need to be manufactured. They all use resources and energy to get manufactured, and they need to be transported to the healthcare facilities. In the UK, supplies are responsible for around 59% of the healthcare's greenhouse gas emissions. But healthcare has also other environmental impacts. Um, so if you think of all the supplies which needs to be transported to the healthcare facilities, but also all the travel patients, visitors and staff um, doing to get to the healthcare facilities, um, we cause a lot of air pollution. So in the UK, 3.5% of all road travel is due to healthcare related activities. And there's also water pollution we have to take into account. And a global study has just found very recently that hundreds of rivers around the world are polluted with dangerously high levels of antibiotics. And this is a key route by which bacteria develop antibiotic resistance. 
But apart from environmental impact, and there's also other impacts like um, deforestation to consider making space for rubber plantations and others, um, there's also social impacts we have to consider on a global scale. For example, the health service here in the UK has admitted that um, they're using the use medical instruments which have been manufactured in Pakistan and often by child labor. But while healthcare accelerates global warming, climate change also has an impact on the healthcare system. On this slide here on the left, you can see a photo of New York University Langone House Hospital being evacuated in the middle of Hurricane Sandy. And on the right is an article about the shortage of many medical products um, because of Hurricane Maria, because many of the medical products were um, are manufactured in Puerto Rico. So apart from mitigating greenhouse gas emissions in the healthcare system, we also have to start adapting. But how does eye care and sustainability overlap? Um, if you think, for example, of cataract surgery, probably most people would think it's a very small procedure, it takes very little time, but it's the most common procedure in the world. 20 million are carried out worldwide and it's expanding. In 2030, we think we will have 30% more of cataract surgeries. It's a very successful surgery, but many health systems spend a lot of money to get them done. So in the UK, they have looked at um, all the greenhouse gas emissions which get uh, produced by doing a cataract surgery. We call that the carbon footprint. And it has been calculated that the single FACO emulsification emits about 180 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. This is about a week of living for the average British person. And over 50% of these greenhouse gas emissions originate again in procurement of supplies. Many of them are largely single-use disposables. So if we assume that um, this is equivalent for all um, cataract surgeries across the world, we would produce annually 3.6 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions um, every year. And with a rise of 30% in surgeries, that would be 4.6 million tonnes. But can we actually assume that across the world, um, each cataract surgery has the same carbon footprint? Do they follow the same process or is there huge variability? So a very good example is the Aravind Eye Care System and Venkatesh will talk in more detail about it later on. Um, they carry out a lot of cataract surgeries every year, 296,000, that is around the 12th of cataract surgeries the US is doing and they have very favorable outcomes, as you can see from the table. So if you compare um, the carbon emissions which are produced by cataract surgery in Aravind um, to the UK, you can see that they produce much less emissions, six kilograms compared to the emissions in the UK. Um, so if we look at what it means um, like driving a car. So um, the carbon emissions which get emitted by FACO emulsification in India is the same um, a car would emit by driving 25 kilometers. But in the UK, it's the same as 500 kilometers of driving a car. Um, and if you think of the waste generation in the operating theater, that can be also very different. So you can see on the left a picture of a cataract remover in uh, the US and its waste compared to 93 cataract removers in India. And um, Cassie has done some research into um, the waste of pharmaceutical in the US at cataract surgery. She's looked at eye drops, ocular injection and systemic medicines and found that a lot of these are disposed of at the end of the surgery. Um, on this graph, you can see um, four different health centers in the US and their pharmaceutical waste. And eye drops is one of the uh, most common um, waste. So how would that impact on the finance list? So you can see that um, the center with the smallest amount of pharmaceutical waste, they waste around 37,000 US dollars a year. 
and the centers with the highest amount of waste, around 190,000 US dollars a year. So this could have a huge social impact, with the cataract surgery um, costing around 3,600 per eye. This waste could theoretically have covered an additional 53 surgeries at each of the latter two locations. And it also has an environmental um, impact that up to 105,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalents can be wasted by just disposing of pharmaceutical waste. If cataract surgery and its pharmaceutical waste show such a huge variability, we can assume that this is also found in other procedures in ophthalmology and also all the other specialties in the healthcare system. It opens up a huge opportunity for all of us to reduce our environmental and social impact. Thank you very much, and I'm passing back to Phil. Thank you, Inga. That's a very good introduction to the triple bottom line and uh, environmental system and sustainability in eye care. And so following that model, you can actually save a lot of money. Um, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for the presenters, please type them in the chat box and I will ask them at the end. Um, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Venkatesh, who's the Chief Medical Officer from Aravind Eye Hospital in Pondicherry. Down to you, Venkatesh. Thank you, Phil. And, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So in the next 20-25 uh, minutes, I will try to take you through uh, the environmental sustainability in uh, uh, eye care, the Aravind model. So we just saw the, the sustainable developed modes, which is going to transform the world. And the two important things would be is kind of responsible consumption. And also we need to take care of the climate action. Sustainability is also a concern for healthcare. If you see these two titles on Lancet, on the left it says, Climate change is the biggest global health threat of 21st century. And also they say tackling the climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century also. I think we have a problem on one side and also a solution on the other side. So WHO also has come up with uh, a very nice guidelines uh, to make a hospital environmental friendly or climate friendly from energy efficiency green building, using alternate energy, transporting their staff and patients, taking care of food, waste and water. So I'm just going to again brief you how Aravind Eye Care System, uh, especially the hospital where I, work, where I work in Pondicherry, how do we go through all these seven elements? So Inge very nicely uh, showed us about the triple P model, where if you think of your people who are the patients and the planet, definitely I think we are going to make profit. And if we do this, I'm sure it's going to be a sustainable health care or an eye care. So what is the need for eye care? Uh, if you see ophthalmology is one of the high volume outpatient specialties because a lot of these patients have chronic diseases like diabetic retinopathy and glaucoma where they need to come back again and again for treatment. And also because of cataract, there is a high surgical throughput wherein we need to do a kind of a high volume of cataract surgery, especially in developing world where there is a lot of backlog of cataracts. And this is a very common elective procedure wherein, as you saw in the previous presentation, there are a lot of disposable supplies and materials which is used for this procedure. So this again was highlighted. The, the volume is growing because uh, people are having surgery at a much, much earlier stage. And so the number of cataract surgeries have been growing. And if you see almost two thirds of this is now phaco emulsification or the newer procedures using laser, wherein you still use more of consumables. Just briefly about Arvind in South India. Uh, we have six tertiary care centers, six secondary care centers, 
and six kind of outpatient clinics which are based in cities where Arvind is placed at a slightly away from the city and also we have a very strong network of primary eye care centers which is almost uh, 67 to 70 at this point of time and it serves a population of close to 80 million which is based in uh, the south of India and the state of Tamil Nadu and a small union territory called Pondicherry. Annually we see close to 4 million outpatients and we do close to 500,000 surgeries and lasers and injections and almost 300,000 is cataracts and if you see most of our services are either free or steeply subsidized almost 50 percent and the other 50 percent are the people who pay for their surgeries if you take the hospital process when it when you take patients they are in access to care and there is a footprint related to diagnosis and advising for the treatment and there is also a footprint related to treatment and then a footprint related to follow -up. so what we do very smartly is to see where all we can reduce this footprint which you say across the plan of management in the form of access to care we take care by seeing not only having hospitals but also outreach and vision centers so that people need not travel much and any anywhere where we want to diagnose or advice treatment we try to close the loop on the same day for example a scan or laser is usually scheduled on the same day so that he is not given an appointment for to come back treatments like cataract we plan and do the very next day and also we try to uh, uh, minimize follow-up visits and also advise them to follow up to the nearest centers wherever uh, we are available so thereby we very uh, uh, meticulously look into the transport of our staff visitors patients and also our suppliers and if you see our procurement and goods and services is also kind of uh, Channelized into one network wherein we have one central office wherein it is procured and then we, we efficiently uh, transport it to some of the major hospitals So if you see in our access to care in in our base hospitals uh, this is totally a non-appointment system in that it, in the meaning the OP is functioning from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and the patient can register and come and uh, see a physician at any point of time and there are both paying and free services and also all these access is possible for primary secondary and tertiary care so that you no know, people can come at any time to the services whether it be in the base hospital or in a vision center when we see the flow of patients now there are several steps which are involved from registration to uh, uh, the testing a patient and doing a final uh, test and then giving them glasses or medicine but uh, we have a very strong network of paramedical whom we call as mid-level ophthalmic personnel who meticulously do several tests to help the doctors make their job better so they are trained to do this job perfectly so one person does one task so that we have a very effective equipment utilization so these equipments are utilized to the maximum for eight to ten hours in a day so that we can be efficient in saving uh, power and another other energy resources and we have a very nice hub and spoke model wherever possible in the form of the tertiary care centers are connected to city center and vision centers so we use this to again facilitate our uh, pre-operative evaluation and also post-operative evaluation and the patients need to travel only for the treatment or surgery and also through our outreach eye camps where we set up a hospital in a uh, semi-urban or a rural village and we transport patients who need fat cataract surgery in a bus to the base hospital and again we do review for them after 30 or 40 days at the same campsites so that we these patients need not travel and these patients are pooled and brought in a bus so that the carbon footprint which is related to travel is also minimal so these are the network of our vision centers in the state of uh, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry uh, this shows 67 centers but at this point of time we have uh, uh, 75 centers but some of them are very new so I have not included them for the data but on an average each center sees a minimum of 20 to 25 patients a day so we see around 2000 outpatients every day through these centers and almost half a million patients have been seen 
in an year 2017 and 18. So the number of new patients is this and the total outpatients is close to half a million and we, we are giving close to 80,000 classes through these vision centers and uh, the number of people almost 25,000 people have advised for surgery and of which are close to 20,000 people have undergone surgery. So these are patients who travel only for their surgery or for the treatment to the nearest base hospital. I'll give you a simple example by which you now we have reduced uh, 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 like kind of the time taken in the delivery of spectacle by the uh, which again helps us in sustainability. Now, for example, what happened a few years back, a couple of years back, uh, when a patient chooses a frame, the particular frame which he chose was sent to the nearest central lab for uh, uh, the lens uh, to be fitted to the frame. And then the completed glass was again sent back to the vision center and then delivered to the patient. So this used to take a lot of time and also a lot of footprint in sending these frames to the lab and getting it back. So now what we do is we just uh, did a thought process and then we had a project and then we finalized certain things and now the frame details are emailed because they once they select the frame it's got a model number the details are sent the lab fits the lens in the frame and the very next day it is sent back. So by this we have reduced the time the patient also were becoming happy the glass order went up at the same time, we have significantly reduced the carbon footprint of moving this frame up and down. This is a simple example of how a supply chain has been taken care to make efficiency at the same time profits also. Same way for diabetic retinopathy screening, we have tied up with wherever possible facilities, including government hospitals, primary health centers, some of the diabetic clinics, you know, where we have these low cost funders cameras. We have trained the technicians of the hospitals to take images, non mitriatic images, upload them. And also in the recent past, we have been using offline artificial intelligence to screen for diabetic retinopathy so that the patients who go for screening to these centers need not go to uh, again travel for another separate diabetic retinopathy screening. So this is one way we have uh, again reduced the carbon footprint related to travel in retinopathy patients. And when it comes to diagnosis and uh, advice of treatment, uh, we follow a very standard operating procedures. And the system is designed in such a way it allows you to finish. For example, a glaucoma where you have a suspect, if you want to do a visual fields or an OCT, no, you, it can be done on the same day. So we, we have a slots for non-appointment patients to undergo the procedure. And the specialty opinion is completed on the same day. And if somebody is ready for a surgery, the very same day he can be admitted and operated the next day or he can come back again on a daycare next day for surgery. So most of the tests are completed on the same day if the patient is prepared for any treatment or procedure. And this again is very important like completing the cycle. For example, a diabetic retinopathy needs laser treatment and he is also mentally prepared for the laser treatment. The laser is completed on the same day and even the glasses uh, we, we have state of art labs and also facilities to fit the glasses in the frame and give it to almost 90% on this on the same day or within a couple of hours and only very few patients come back to receive it or it is courier to them or posted to them and patients who are advised for surgery if they are ready also are admitted in the same day so we we just saw this in uh, the previous presentation you now where uh, i was fortunate to work with casey in uh, in seeing the carbon footprint related to cataract surgery because you know, it's on high volume surgery. A lot of consumables are used. Even the equipment like FACO machines and uh, microscopes are, you know, the, in, the capital investment is very high. And also a complex waste is generated. It's not a very simple waste. There are so many things involved from biomedical to plastic and paper and all that. So if we can efficiently manage this waste, you know, we can also uh, kind of uh, reduce uh, the carbon footprint related to that. So how do we really make uh, the surgical strategy very efficient? We have a very good layout. Most of our layouts are planned in such a way that there is a pre-operative workup area, then the uh, area where they are prepared in the form of preparation rooms, anesthesia rooms. So every layout is planned like that. And if you see the uh, video which is running, you can see every staff is doing the task which they are allotted to do. Like somebody cleans the high, somebody is helping them to uh, be prepared for the ration, somebody assists the surgeon and the surgeon is really focused on what he is supposed to do. 
So we have this twin table system where the surgeon would uh, complete a surgery by the time the next patient will be prepared so that he need not waste time between cases. So he can move quickly to the next patient and do surgery. And this reduces a lot of waste and also uh, it uh, kind of brings in a lot of efficiency. And uh, we have systems in place to have checklists to maintain safety and quality standards is also highly maintained as the results which you have seen the complication rates are much less our end of uh, rate is uh, 0 0.02 that is two patients in uh, 10,000 surgeries which we do here when compared to international standards of 8 in 10,000 surgeries so again even you when you see again the efficiency you can see here by increasing the number of tables an efficient surgeon who is skilled enough can comfortably do six to eight surgeries so by increasing the number of tables by the people who assist him and then the number of instruments is also the instrument sets are increased so that he doesn't wait for uh, the uh, the autoclaving or the uh, full cycle autoclave to happen to come back so if you can do this the the output of a surgeon also increases so some uh, uh, systems where we have high volume surgery 400 to 500 surgeries are done by four or five surgeons uh, in a day or an half a day, some 10 surgeons can comfortably do those 400 surgeries. So the productivity of the eye surgeon also significantly goes up and Arvind, the cataract surgeon, would do close to 1,500 to 2,000 surgeries every year when compared to the national average uh, in India and in rest of Asia, if you see it's only 400 or 300 surgeries. And most of the supplies are shared and there is very minimal use of single-use instruments and reuse of single use instruments with strict sterilization protocols. They go for a flash autoclaving in between and then they come back. A very good uh, supply chain management and a meticulous waste segregation and also a very good uh, mindset and a culture of reduce, recycle and reusing a lot of things. So I'm not going to again go into detail. People are aware of this. Uh, the life cycle assessment again from the previous presentation. There is always an upstream and a downstream for any product. And, uh, and many of the times, if you see in ophthalmology, there are so much of consumables, like what you see here, the, the nurse who is preparing in the morning. So there is a meticulous waste separation. Even the plastic and paper is separated so that we can efficiently send this out for recycling. So anything which is biomedical waste will go, uh, it, it is disposed at the end of the day. Anything which is like the plastic drape, packing materials, like what you see here which is being dumped uh, can be effectively recycled and also some revenue can be generated from that and many of our uh, uh, regular stuff which we use like the surgery dress and gowns at the end of the day they go for the central sterile uh, sterilization the trays and pans also go at the end of the day in between it is flash autoclave for every uh, like eight to ten sets go to the flash autoclave and they come back at the end of the day they go for full cycle and the biomedical waste is meticulously separated and it is contracted outside to a biomedical waste disposer. And some of these needles and uh, uh, cotton swabs was, which are used are again, it goes into biomedical puncture proof container and disposed. And a lot of stuff can be efficiently recycled. Almost two thirds of this packing material, which are paper and plastic can be uh, recycled and also sent for sale. This is just to show the how some of that has recycled and sent for sale. And we are able to generate a lot of money by effectively kind of separating this waste meticulously and uh, even our food waste you know we have a, a biogas plant most of the food waste is again crushed and it goes to the biogas plant so that we can generate some gas for again the functioning of the kitchen so this picture you just saw uh, a, a single case versus uh, 90 or 100 FACO cases at Arvind. So the weight which we uh, generate for every case is much, much negligible than the weight of uh, waste which is pro produced elsewhere. But the most important thing is in spite of this, our complication rates, our infection rates are being in par with international standards. So I'm not going to go again through this, but basically not to show you the waste which we generate at Arvind. You are just traveling uh, 25 kilometers in uh, 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 parallel to somebody traveling 500 kilometers in UK or in US. So basically these are the five R's which I would stress on. We are trying to lower the amount of waste produced. We use materials uh, repeatedly but most of them are evidence-based. 
like uh, like a, a single phaco cassette which goes into the machine stays up to to the end of the day we are not we are not changing them for every case and then we are very effectively recycling and of course we have a very good instrument maintenance department which repairs and make sure everything is in order they do a lot of uh, preventive maintenance so that we don't have any uh, repairs happening and also we rethink you know we use certain things uh, uh, by rethinking and then uh, making it uh, get a particular uh, use before it is disposed and these are some of the other areas which i'll quickly touch upon in transport we are reducing the patient visits uh, like how these patients are pulled and they are brought from an icap using a public transport and then we encourage some of the patients to go back for review to the satellite centers like vision centers or to outreach camps and most of our staff live within the campus and we all uh, work uh, we all just walk to work so that we can save a lot of time in this also so the building is also or most of our buildings are green buildings they bring in a lot of natural light and ventilation and we have a lot of space for garden and vegetation and uh, uh, most of our uh, uh, the kitchen garden helps us to maintain our own uh, kitchens which is used for patient care and also for the staff who are living within the campus and the buildings are also energy efficient they all have uh, solar panels uh, for alternate energy generation and they are on grid you know we almost 60% of our electricity what we generate is used for us and only 40% we need to buy from outside and there is a very effective instrument and electrical maintenance and uh, and we have also uh, done some installation of clean energy elsewhere to generate electricity and this carbon footprint is closely assessed using uh, an app like this the amount of energy which we generate and how much we use and when it comes to food again as i said before you now we we kind of uh, uh, even engage our patients to reduce wastage of food in cafeteria by putting up posters like this and also creating a lot of awareness to our own staff and patient and uh, the food waste is also used uh, uh, optimally in the uh, in the biogas plant which we have and when it comes to water we have a very good decentralized wastewater treatment plant which almost filters 90% of our water and only 10% is water is wasted and this 90% is used for uh, greening our garden and also for uh, cultivating our paddy and uh, the vegetable garden so what what i would like to finally conclude is say that you know for being uh, uh, planet friendly and being patient centered it needs a high level of commitment and we need to keep on raising the staff awareness and we need to engage our staff and our customers who are the patients in this environmental friendly activity so that they also try to practice at some point of time in their life and we always look for opportunities and we try to identify and implement some of the ideas and also we try to take this uh, message forward through iapp and other agencies across the globe thank you thank you venkatesh that's a very very enlightening presentation and overview of the arab in eye care model and uh, a lot we can learn from that model thank you very much um we'll now move on to some questions uh we haven't got any questions so far so please uh, if you have any questions type them in um i was just wondering whether what what three things we can do right away that will contribute to the environmental sustainability i know in quit and equipment if we look at faco machines uh with reusable um consumables reusable gowns um look at bulk procurement but i'm just wondering if there's any anything else that the uh, presenters can uh, can answer to stop yeah the no, one thing which i have seen uh, some people practice even in us is uh, trying to at least separate the paper and plastic waste you no know, instead of dumping into one uh, uh, waste like in most of the operating rooms Uh, all the waste which is generated for one cataract surgery is, is into one bin and then it goes outside so if we can at least separate uh, the things like the the cassette or the tubings and the lens boxes the 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 pamphlets which comes with the lenses uh, things like that which can be recycled no there's there's no trace of biomedical waste in that so if you can separate that that will be a great idea and i've seen that being happening in salt lake city 
Dr. Alan Crandall, uh, who is a good friend and mentor for us, have started doing it with Dr. Jeff Patty in uh, Salt Lake City. Thank you, Venkatesh. I've got a question here. Um, is there a tick sheet available to check your environmental sustainability status, almost like an audit sheet? Uh, not actually. I don't, I don't think we have uh, anything of that sort. Maybe we'll have to think of implementing uh, something like that. It's David here. Okay. okay, there's a question here. Um, I'm curious about how the Aravin model can be replicated in smaller population areas. For example, is the vision centers or does it require a large population stroke patient catchment area to have efficiency gains? For example, having staff on one on site, high patient volume, etc. It, uh, it, it is feasible, but uh, there, there should be some amount of population who can access to that care. Now, we, have, we put up centers where we have a population of 50,000 to 100,000. And most of these centers are self-sustainable after a couple of years through the business which they generate by consultation fees, which is very nominal in the form of 20 Indian rupees. And by selling medicine and glasses, they are able to self-sustain on their own after a couple of years. But the most important thing is in our system, all the vision centers are connected to the base hospital for telemedicine. So every patient gets uh, uh, advice from the doctor through telemedicine. So the tele vision centers are run by optometrists and ophthalmic assistants, but the patient at the end of the care is being consulted with an ophthalmologist. But that's a key, I think, for success for any vision center. You should have a good teleconnectivity and also an ideal population uh, because in, where the population is very sparse, if you are going to put a vision center, uh, it may be very difficult to sustain it. But definitely the need will be there, but it will be difficult to sustain it. So it may look for a, somebody supporting that center to run. Okay, thank you, Venkatesh. I think all the, all the questions seem to be directed to, uh, to you. Um, there's another question okay. here. Um, what is the relationship with recyclers? Was it easy to get them to recycle clean hospital waste? And also, what is the what is the plastics that you are recycling made from? Some of our members have had challenges to get it recycled because it, it is done from different polymers, uh, difficult to see in the recycling process. Uh, I, I don't know the real uh, the polymers behind it uh, between the different plastics, but the plastics which are very people have I mean, we can easily sell or some of the lens boxes. You know? These plastics are really good. And the other ones which are uh, again recycled are the caps which comes with the knives and blades. Not the knife holders, but the caps, the protective caps which comes with that. So uh, people are really locking for it. I mean, uh, we once we collect it, it is immediately taken by the spas, I mean, the, the people who collect it. So basically, I think they use it for using reusable plastics in the form of uh, they make some uh, vessels or utensils of plastic in this this part of the country. So, so some of the thick plastics are recycled very quickly. I'm not talking about the wrappings and things like that, which is very difficult to get uh, get it recycled. But the very the, the thick plastics, especially the lens boxes, the knife caps and things like that, are. Uh, or uh, generate some money also. Um, okay, thank you. Just uh, another question. Um, well done, the IEPB and Environmental Sustainability Working Group for these for this webinar. Is there a plan to develop more IEPB sustainable sustainability in initiatives, please? David, I think you might be able to answer that, or I can answer that. Uh, hi, Phil. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to say that um, when we formed the community of practice, a very clear thing we wanted to do was actually uh, gather experiences from people all around the world because uh, I think almost every eye health uh, unit is doing something in this area and then by pooling all our ideas together, we can um, 
come up with something really good just as Aravind has done. So yeah, there, there's it, the idea is that we could um, develop model projects as well as uh, pull in resources from around the world. And also just quickly to say that on our IAPB Environmental Sustainability webpage, there is a case study from CBM, which does have some useful checklists in it. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, okay, another question here. Um, what is the waste management system at Aravind? Um, so I, I think in the presentation, I briefly showed you one picture which uh, uh, describes what happens to biomedical waste uh, at the end of the day and also some of the waste which is separated meticulously at source in the form of papers, plastics, the booklets which comes with intraocular lenses and some of the devices which you use. Uh, so, so these are waste which are separated and then the a biomedical waste goes to a separate source and then it is being contracted out uh, to a central uh, biomedical waste contractor who burns it off and then there are several other cartons and swaps are incinerated locally and the plastics and the paper waste which is generated from uh, uh, all these resources which i just said are then separated they are collected in one place and uh, for every two weeks again they are recycled and they are sold outside to a scrap uh, vendor Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here which I'm trying to work out how to answer it at the moment. Um, has IEPB had any engagement with WHO around the guidelines they set and advocate to national governments around embedding sustainability targets and meeting the SDGs? The answer is, I believe, is yes, uh, but I'm not handling it myself. Um, but we'll look into that uh, particular question. Okay. Um, okay, there's another question here. Um, I know some hospitals, uh, brackets in New Zealand, for example, have their own worm farms and other inside recycling processes. Has Arabin done anything like that? No, not to not to that extent. I mean, we, have, we don't have any. That's it's more like having your own uh, worm culture and things like that. We have not done anything of that sort. We, we, we have just invested some something like warmy warmy composting you now where you can grind some of the waste and then this can be used into the uh, biogas plant so we, we have not invested or uh, tried anything of that sort no i think i think she was uh, alluding to cardboard and kitchen uh, waste um for these for the worm farms um um yeah okay um, are there any more questions? I haven't got any more questions uh, coming up. Um, we have, if, if there's anything that comes up, you can contact us uh, by communications at IBB and we'll, we'll, we'll pose those to the Environmental Sustainability Working Group. But uh, we've got another five minutes. If there's anybody else that wants to pose any more questions. One question I have actually um, on a on the procurement and equipment side is that um, a lot of appliances, and I'm, I'm sure this is in the UK and in, in the US and in Europe, have um, energy saving ratings um, on them. And we're just wondering whether we can in introduce that to um, equipment, hospital equipment, um, to get some sort of ratings. And that's something we can perhaps uh, place on the standard list of equipment. Um, is anybody known of, of anything like that at all? I, I have no idea. Okay, yeah, thank I you. I have no idea what's happening in the UK either on this. Well, I will certainly pose the question to some of our manufacturers and see whether that's something that they will they will look at. I have another uh, question here. Have there been any examples of financial incentives to support improved waste and sustainability practices in eye health care or disincentives? disincentives like pollution taxes? Anybody like to answer that? 
not, a, not, not an easy question. I, I only, I mean, in, in the UK, you don't um, get much from waste. I think the only thing we've heard is that um, cardboard can make some, some um, money f um, in the hospitals to recycle it. Um, I haven't heard of any financial incentives to get hospitals to recycle so far. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I'd like to end by thanking our presenters, David, Inga and Venkatesh for their comprehensive presentations and responses to the questions. Uh, thanks for Susan for the technical support here. We wouldn't have not been able to do this without Susan. And thank you everyone who has participated. This has been an introduction to the IPB Environmental Sustainability Working Group. And if you like more information, you can find information, resources, and downloadable documents on the IEPB website under Working Groups. Uh, you will receive a survey via email directly from GoToMeeting email address. So please take a couple, few minutes to complete it, as your support for these webinars makes them possible and your feedback helps us to improve them. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you, you at future IEPB webinars. Thank you very much.